Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to um, uh, Bloomsbury House, which is still part of IISS, and thank you all for braving the uh, summer rain to come out here. Um, my name is Nigel Inkster. I'm the Director of Transnational Threats and Political Risk here at IISS, and firstly, I should apologize for being slightly informally dressed. I've just uh, come from the airport, and I was delighted to have made it in time to be able to chair um, this session. Um, our speaker today, Dr. Vanda Felbeb Brown of the Brookings Institution, uh, despite her youth, has established a very considerable pedigree um, studying this uh, very fascinating nexus of uh, organized criminality um, and violent conflict, which um, has done so much to affect uh, significant areas of the uh, developing world. Um, she has done a great deal of field work and has produced uh, a number of um, publications, including recently in the IISS in-house journal Survival, uh, and I would certainly commend them to you. One in particular, Shooting Up, I kind of was, I was hoping that we'd be able to get that title for ourselves, but Vanda, you got there first, and uh, I think you actually produced a more interesting book, if I may say so. Oh, you're and uh, your latest publication, I think, is entitled Aspirations and Ambivalence, Strategies and Realities of Counterinsurgency and State Building in Afghanistan. Right, okay, this is not a book launch. Uh, but, um, you know, we're, we're, we're very fortunate uh, to have uh, Vanda with us to talk about uh, this uh, nexus of issues, um, which I think it's fair to say around the turn of the millennium was starting to attract a greater um, policy focus than may now seem to be the case but has been somewhat displaced by the inevitable need to focus on transnational terrorism. Um, I think perhaps the pieces are beginning to rearrange themselves on the board, perhaps in favor of a return to, shall we say, a broader spectrum approach to conflict. Um, but uh, the issue of the extent to which organized crime is A, organized, and B, rises to the level of a strategic threat is one that I think challenges a lot of uh, policy communities. So I'm looking forward, as I know we all are, to uh, hearing um, Vanda talk about this. I, I think you're okay with everything being on the record? Is, yes. yes. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Well, um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for the introduction, Nigel, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's an honor and a delight to be able to address you today, and uh, I will just make some remarks and then uh, really hope to have a dialogue uh, and conversation with you rather than uh, make it too much of a lecture, uh, given the very distinguished and knowledgeable audience. I will eventually get to talking about organized crime, but uh, allow me a little bit of an ellipsis and start talking about illicit economies. That is actually a reason uh, that I'm doing that, that I hope will be apparent uh, during the talk, and if it's not, <laughs> I'll make it more explicit. We often think about organized crime as being linked to illegal markets or illicit economies. I would actually suggest that um, neither illicitness per se uh, nor organizational structures are a reason why organized crime either emerges, persists, or exists. And in fact, there are very many legal markets uh, that are pervaded by organized crime. Nonetheless, uh, illicit economies um, often invite themselves by the nature of their illicitness to have uh, organized operatives, perhaps even organized crime, as key enablers of these illicit economies. Many of these illicit economies pose severe threats uh, to states and society, whether in the form of um, uh, undesirable social behavior, such as addiction, or um, in the form of economic challenges, a large illicit economy will have negative, often negative uh, as, uh, effects on uh, a legal economy, uh, whether um, in the form of environmental threats uh, to states and societies, um, effects on judicial system and um, uh, law enforcement capacity, often very intense, very prevalent um, um, organized crime and illicit economies eviscerate uh, 
any rule of law capacity in the state, but there are different and uh, complicated feedback dynamics. You could make the argument that it is the pre-existing absence of effective uh, uh, law enforcement and rule of law that really enable and shape uh, how organized uh, crime emerges uh, or illicit economy spread um, in this context. But most severely, illicit economies and organized crime can pose very profound security challenges to uh, the state and society. You look at uh, countries in Latin America with homicides rates um, in the you know, above 50 per 100,000, in some cases far greater than that, and the uh, amount of deaths, uh, homicide deaths in the tens of thousands per year, we are really looking at violence rates that, that are greater than in combat zones such as Afghanistan or Iraq for that matter, and the debility how society can shape and organize itself. Societies become eviscerated and deeply undermine their social fabric and organizational capacity, uh, becomes deeply affected by the violence. The violence cannot simply be dismissed as a context within which people exist. And in some cases, they can threaten the very nature uh, of the state, especially when um, insurgent militant groups with some desire to either overthrow the state or at least control some territories come to dominate um, particular illicit economies and or absorb organized crime groups. But at the same time, and the real difficulty in challenging, uh, and, uh, in, in changing, mitigating the illicit economies and suppressing them is that um, around the world, uh, millions, hundreds of millions of people uh, participate in illicit economies and depend on illicit economies for their very survival and all social uh, economic mobility that's available to them. Consequently, policies that predominantly focus on suppression have very limited traction uh, with those populations and in fact can be directly antagonistic uh, to their interest. And so um, there are limits to how suppression, um, how law enforcement purely in these contexts can, uh, can uh, get one, especially if the illicit economies are not only a source of livelihood and socioeconomic benefits, but essentially a source of provision of public goods that would otherwise not be available to these marginalized populations. And clever organized crime groups and clever militants will not simply derive um, financial benefits, financial profits from the illicit economies, but will use the illicit economy to turn themselves into proto-state entities by appropriating the illicit economy in a way that is uniquely available to them to deliver both profits for the population, jobs, employment, socioeconomic goods, <coughs> but also a variety of public good services, uh, including uh, public good services such as uh, dispute resolution mechanisms, um, adjudication of crimes, and even suppression of crimes. You can say, look, this is paradoxical. It's both the militants and the uh, organized crime groups that are the source of violence in the first place. That might be the case. They are source of some violence, including potentially very undirected violence that affects societies. But at the same time, they often take it upon themselves to control and regulate certain types of violence, often making the situation more permissive for populations uh, to um, go about every, their everyday business. And, and indeed, critically, uh, I, I would suggest whether uh, in my other work on counterinsurgencies uh, or in my work on organized crime and illicit economies, that we often mismeasure uh, and misconceptualize uh, what security for people means. We often focus on factors such as the number of Taliban attacks in the territory or the number of homicides attributable to uh, the PCC in Brazil, an organized crime group, uh, a gang, an urban gang in Brazil. Whereas, um, from my experience, um, people in highly violent uh, context often perceive their human security essentially as the um, predictability and complexity of negotiations they have to engage on a daily basis to go about their elemental uh, needs. And consequently, a brutal, nonetheless predictable order can often be far more per permissive than a highly contestable order. Hence, even organized crime groups that provide a level of regulation, even as they are themselves source of uh, uh, violence in, in, in some extent, can develop what I call political capital. 
And indeed, even organized crime groups uh, then have capacity to really posit themselves as, legit as ruling entities with the degree of legitimacy. This legitimacy is not absolute, but absolute doesn't matter. It's like asking people, do you like the Taliban in Afghanistan? They will say, no, we don't. But this is a completely irrelevant question. The only question that matters to them is, do you like X, Y, and Z, the Taliban, compared to whatever context you exist in and whatever other ruling options uh, uh, that are available? And, and so there's this big debate in the field has been going on for over a decade about whether today there is any difference between um, insurgents and, and criminals, whether they have morphed into one homogenous entity. Uh, I would argue that they have definitely not morphed into one homogenous entity. And, and we do ourselves, both as analysts and policymakers, a lot of disservice by treating them that way. Nonetheless, a part of the debate is very misguided. It essentially assumes that to the extent ideo that ideology wanes for militant groups, they essentially become criminals. But as I would flip uh, the, the concept around and say, Ideology is not the determining factor of uh, political acceptance or political capital. Really what matters is ruling capacity. And organized crime groups can exhibit the same level of ruling capacity as militants. And of course there are huge variations. Some militants are very incompetent. Some urban gangs, say the Mungiki in Kenya, are very incompetent in how they rule. They're essentially thuggish with minimum provision of public good services but really sophisticated organized crimes group will behave in their ruling capacity in a manner uh, that is very um, similar to uh, a way that um, sophisticated militant uh, groups will. And um, even, when, uh, even in the context when they are quite incompetent and really haven't learned how to build, if not support, at least acceptance among the population, I would ask you, what is a more political act than money and bullets? Even if there is no, not ideology, what more determines life on the street and has political implication than uh, being the, the entity that controls the amount of bullets that fly on the street and distributes the money that determines the social life of the, of the, the place? So um, groups like uh, Los Templarios uh, in Michoacan uh, really fundamentally challenge the capacity of the Mexican state to rule, not because they are so violent, but because they have so deeply permeated the state that people go to them for dispute resolutions, not to the vestiges uh, or, or uh, minimal um, uh, institutions that, that exist in uh, Michoacan. If you then accept this proposition, essentially, that um, even organized crime groups can have political capital and have profound political and institutional effects, then I would posit what follows is that the proper way to think about combating um, these phenomena, this uh, spectrum of organized crime and militancy, is to think essentially of organized crime as a competition in state making. Competition with the state as well as with um, perhaps other non-state entities over the allegiance uh, of the population. What follows from that is that law enforcement and security provision, public safety provision, is in a, an inescapable and critical function of the state. <coughs> That's what has to be applied in the context of these other economies. But it's not a sufficient response, or at least in the vast majority of time, it is not a sufficient response. The goal needs to be to wean off the populations from this fairly um, willing uh, acceptance of non-state uh, actors. So the, the competition is not simply about the physical uh, aspect of security, but essentially about minds as well. So along with uh, the law enforcement response, there is also a need to adopt a, um, a social, socioeconomic uh, policy response. Now, let me be the first to, to uh, say that many socioeconomic responses designed to combat organized crime are woefully inadequate. Uh, if you look at Mexico today, President Peña Nieto says a lot of very positive things, but essentially anyone uh, that has ever done anything on social policy now says this is part of crime prevention or long-term uh, anti-crime effort, regardless of how relevant the policy essentially is for this anti-crime effort. 
Um, similarly, in um, uh, Rio, under Virada Social, the software aspect of UPEPE, essentially anything goes, lots of the programs are misdesigned. So obviously the operationalization and implementation is as important as the strategic concept. Nonetheless, I would posit that uh, developing socioeconomic responses is as important as developing um, a, um, a, a law enforcement uh, response. I also need to um, uh, emphasize right away that um, many of these socioeconomic responses are essentially held hostage to broader um, political economic patterns uh, in the economy. We were talking a little bit about Colombia prior uh, to the talk, and there are good reasons why alternative livelihoods um, for coca uh, have not worked. There are many reasons, but one of them is that essentially the system is completely rigged to uh, privilege the, the most landed, <laughs> most um, uh, upper class um, agro-businesses that essentially guarantees that small farmers cannot compete. And not only is it economically like this way, it's very much entrenched in the political system of the country. In this context, you can put a lot of money uh, in alternative mm -hmm. livelihoods. They will essentially not, not work unless taxation patterns and access to economic competitions uh, are fundamentally changed. And the response also needs to be about uh, providing um, other public goods, such as dispute resolution mechanism. If the institutions of the state are too distant or unavailable, can you develop alternative um, um, approaches? Can there be something like us as the Justicia to stick with the uh, Colombia example, for example? Um, over time, the goal, of course, should be to move toward formal institution, particularly formal rule of law. But um, in the short term, there can perhaps be creative um, ways to um, think about how to reduce and eventually eliminate the dependence of um, societies or marginalized segments of population on non-state entity, on pernicious non-state entities uh, for the provision of public goods. Along with that, of course, needs to come a bulk of other policies such as uh, respect for human rights. Uh, if you have a very strong law enforcement response that essentially kills entire villages, there will be limits to how much such policies will be acceptable in most circumstances unless the state can demonstrate uh, an extraordinary um, uh, preponderance of power. So you know, China under Mao um, was one of the most effective countries to destroy organized crime and destroy illicit economies, literally destroy them at the cost of millions of lives lost, something that should not be acceptable to any of us, nor is it available uh, in most uh, societies. Uh, let me talk a little bit return to the issue of the nexus of organized crime and, and terrorism. And I have a little bit uh, prefaced already my views on it, namely that the two have not morphed into a homogenous entity, nor do I, for that matter, believe the common narrative that um, if an organized crime group or a smuggling network peddles in um, substance X, say marijuana, they will inevitably be willing to uh, traffic, uranium, or um, other goods, that the networks are completely um, flexible. I, I don't believe that at all, actually. My experience with organized crime groups is that the vast majority are both quite specialized, but also very conscious of the cost of attracting attention of law enforcement. Criminals make choices about what is too risky. So I would interview uh, uh, marijuana smugglers in Morocco and ask them, why don't you take cocaine? There is a tremendous amount of cocaine flowing uh, through this route to Europe, to Britain. And he said, no, it's too risky. No one enforces marijuana, but people mm. focus on cocaine. Nonetheless, there are some groups, um, often the most advanced, the most dangerous, that will, have, that will be essentially poly franchise entities, mm. that will have the capacity skills mm. and perhaps even um, a, a sense of uh, risks and benefits that will be willing to um, um, be very flexible in what kind of uh, uh, transactional crime they engage in. And those clearly are the ones that are most dangerous, including from the perspective of the terrorism nexus. But even in, in those groups, I think there is a great deal of signaling that law enforcement can, and in fact does, in steering criminals in a certain direction and uh, not in other. But for law enforcement to signal effectively and to develop uh, effective deterrence uh, 
capacity. One needs to make choices. And to the extent that one treats uh, the criminals and the militants as a homogenous entity to start with, uh, one can very likely drive both precisely into the nexus uh, that we don't want to see. So let me give you an example from Somalia where I was for a few weeks in April. Uh, it's been long argued, incorrectly, that uh, the pirates and, the, and Shabab cooperate. In fact, it's been a very conflictual relationship between the two. Nonetheless, for separate reasons, both the Shabab and the pirates have come under a lot of pressures. They have been pushed to um, territories where they interact more um, often in Puntland, and they're both under pressure. And what has happened now is that in some instances, Shabab was either essentially <laughs> offering itself as a protection for the pirates, which didn't make it very far, but there was an effort to build a relationship, more positive relationship from a previously completely conflictual one. But m more interestingly, what has happened is that out of work pirates who find it too risky to venture on the seas now are essentially um, providing illegal protection to illegal fishing uh, ships that often carry other cargo, including arms that is being um, uh, then smuggled to Shabab. And there is more of a linkage. Uh, but it was precisely in how law enforcement uh, and counterinsurgency efforts took place without thinking how we can inadvertently drive the groups together. So in fact, a key part of law enforcement should be to think actually the opposite. What is it that we can do to develop a conflictual relationship uh, between the two rather than to drive them together? Now, there can be a great risks, and that is increases in violence, which are debilitating for society and unsustainable. So that needs to be part of the calculation. Nonetheless, um, Law enforcement very much has capacity to influence um, how firm or conflictual uh, the nexus is. Let me conclude then by um, arguing that in terms of transactional crimes as opposed to predatory crimes, uh, the purpose of law enforcement is to make good criminals. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, when I say that in the US, uh, I, I give this lecture to the FBI, and when I, I usually start with the, this opening sentence, and there is this big gasp, uh, and I'm just sort of waiting for uh, my interlocutors in the room to, to pull the gun. Uh, but essentially, I mean three things by good criminals. Number one is criminals that are not very violent. Even in terms of organized crime groups, there is a huge variation in how violent and how antagonistic to the state they are. So you can look at criminal markets in East Asia, which are very powerful, dominated by groups that sometimes go back decades. Yes, they evolve, they change. They're not the same that they were a few decades ago. But they are very nonviolent. The, the violence rates are slightly higher than in Western Europe. And look at uh, uh, Central America, where violence rates are extraordinary, and it's very much of criminals out of control of themselves and their environments, uh, uh, far more, and, and it is this, this situation rather than the, the fact that they, part, they are organized crime groups and they participate in the same types of illegal economies that drives violence. What is also striking, uh, since uh, I've raised this comparison, is of course that in the East Southeast Asian context, uh, the urban gangs and organized crime groups have by and large still far more firmly under the thumb of the state, even when the state has gone through tremendous uh, political regime changes. Uh, whereas what has essentially happened in Latin America is that groups that were controlled, co-opted by organized crime groups have broken free and have come to challenge the state in, in ways that were unimaginable a few decades ago. So the first aspect of a good criminal is a very nonviolent criminal. Essentially the way drug trafficking <coughs> is done in Britain or US today, as opposed to the way it was done in the US in the 80s or uh, is done in Latin America. The second aspect of a good criminal is a criminal that uh, doesn't have much capacity to corrupt. And the responses there really have much less to do about <laughs> focused deterrent strategies and signaling and selective targeting by law enforcement as in the case, how do you shape criminals to be nonviolent? And far more to do with what kind of resilience uh, can be built into law enforcement institutions. Uh, there will always be situations where individuals can be corrupt. What one wants to avoid is having entire institutions completely corrupted by organized crime to the extent that the best uh, 
uh, drug traffickers, the top couples on the block, are top law enforcement officials, like in West Africa or um, Latin America today. So it's much more about what kind of resilience is vetting, revetting we build into the institutions and the system, rather than how we signal and how we selectively target criminals. And the third aspect of a criminal is one that is as distant from society as possible. One on whom society does not depend for provision of public goods and socioeconomic goods. So is the criminal that exists on the margins of a ghetto, life can be very difficult and we should not neglect him, but it's not a situation where the criminal um, is the hero that gets elected to uh, the Senate in Kenya because he is the um, uh, politician, despite the fact that he's a major drug trafficker who hands out uh, most goodies uh, to the population. And that there is still a presumption that criminality is banned. So what we want to achieve is uh, having people obey laws. There are two aspects of that. One is enforcing and punishing those that violate the laws. But the other aspect is uh, to design such laws that societies can internalize. People will be able to internalize them if they believe they serve their fundamental interest. To the extent that laws are seen as something that belongs to someone else or that directly threatens my human security, I will likely not obey the law and I will be very susceptible to the militant or capo that shows up on the block and says, I will enable your human security to grow if you stick with me as opposed to the state. Um, let me finish here, and uh, I'm very happy to get into specifics on many different cases. Feel free to ask. Um, Wanda, thanks very, th thanks very much for a fascinating presentation. You know, as somebody who believes that the traditional British stiff upper lip urgently needs to make a, a return, I was delighted to see that our reaction to your proposition about <laughs> creating good criminals elicited a much more phlegmatic response than uh, in the United States. Uh, so thanks very much for that. Um, we've got uh, about half an hour for conversations and questions. Um, can I just ask that when you, if you, you know, catch my eye, raise your hand, please, before um, asking your question, tell us uh, who you are. Uh, yes, front row. Oh, thank you. These are uh, questions that really cut uh, to the core of, I would argue, social organizations. They're also enormously complex questions, so I will be very adventurous and try to answer them quickly in the, in the context of the setting where you know, the answer could be a book. Uh, well, what is fascinating to me, particularly in the Japanese case, even more so than Italian case, is that um, the state has essentially managed to emerge and develop itself in conjunction with the uh, development of organized crime. And in many ways, that growth and merger was very um, joined all along with a great deal of state acceptance of the proposition that organized crime was a tool of state making. It was not simply a competition in state making in this case, but very much a tool of state making. And uh, a, a state and society that designed economic institutions that um, enabled um, and, and built into the system opportunities for organized crime groups um, to both challenge but also deliver services to businesses that yielded to great uh, acceptance uh, of organized crime groups. Now, the very interesting proposition and perhaps one that you can, or the very interesting question and one you can perhaps answer better than, than I can is um, this acceptance seems to be challenged in the past decade more so than ever. There is more of a response on the part of society and on the part of key Japanese businesses in <coughs> rejecting the Yakuza with whom they have existed for so long so very comfortably. Um, and, and so the question is why? What, what is changing in society or economic patterns? But nonetheless, 
you, you have essentially a state development that accepted, used and accepted organized crime groups as state making uh, as part of institutional development and part of um, control of society. In Latin America, the situation is similar but different, that the state essentially delegates large segments of countries and large segments of population to a non-interest, where you then have the emergence of organized crime groups or, or gangs that the state subsequently tries to co-opt, and often co-opt for a while quite effectively. But the difference, I would say, is um, one where sort of there is neglect by the state in the case of Latin America. Now, of course, I'm generalizing hugely, right? Latin America is not a homogenous place, but nonetheless, allow me to be a crude American and make these big generalizations. So uh, in the context of Latin America, the state is very, very narrow, and it functions for the provision of services of extraordinarily narrow segment of population and says, we don't care about these large peripheries, and peripheries being defined functionally as well, and eventually you have organized crime that emerges there, and the organized crime starts butting up against the state. Uh, and then the state says, okay, we need to do something, and their response varies between ineffective law enforcement suppression and co-optation. And this goes on for decades. Now what's been happening over the past 15 years, 20 years, is that this co-optation has essentially collapsed for different reasons in different parts of Latin America, very different reasons in Mexico than in Central America, but nonetheless, all of a sudden, the co-optation is no longer accepted, and the organized crime groups start to challenge the state very violently and very much pushing the boundaries, whereas in East Asia, very crudely, very broadly, whether it's Japan or Indonesia for that matter, uh, the state essentially stays dominant in uh, control uh, of its organized crime. And uh, in, you know, in Somalia, it's, uh, it, it's, you don't have a state in Somalia. You have vestiges of state, perhaps at the city level, uh, but uh, you know, I sometimes joke that no country can exist so long in the Hobbesian state uh, as Somalia. Now, it's a facetious comment because it's not a Hobbesian state. There are ruling entities. There are very many ruling entities, but their scale of rule is very limited. Um, but there are clans, often that's, uh, and often uh, really it's the, the clan that is the basis of organized crime or illicit economies rather than outside entities challenging the, challenging the clan. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I'm going to some five or six channels for Latin America, if you have any sense. Um, I'd like to ask about violence, in, especially in Mexico, uh -huh. uh, where uh, when there is a response by the government, although in Latin America, uh, a lot of places you're right to say that. Uh, the state is absent and this Thank absence uh, fuels uh, you know, groups. In Mexico, uh, sometimes I wonder uh, why, what is the motivation of the groups in continuing their violence? Mm -hmm. Because you see that uh, this, uh, although the, the, there is an efficiency in law enforcement sometimes and corruption, the, the state has responded aggressively, especially against the highly brutal group groups like Los Cibas, mm -hmm. and they have suffered heavily, they have lost leaders. Uh, and, and yet they continue. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on why this endurance of brutal violence despite the state response. <coughs> Colombia, second brief question. What do you think of the um, pacifying police units in Brazil, in the favelas? Uh, there, there are some uh, criticism that... The Including by the Pope? Yeah. <laughs> that the, 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 the drug groups just moved to, to mm -hmm. other places. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh -huh. um, Mexico. Um, Indeed, I, I would argue that the Mexican market is an extremely aberrant criminal market, one that is out of control. It's out of control of the state, and it's out of control of the criminal groups. Um, the state is very much responsible to triggering the violence. I mean, you have larger structural conditions of capacity and utter corruption of law enforcement that goes back a long time, and essentially the, the co-optation deals collapses before the pre loses power back in the 80s. Uh, and Mexico tries several times to undertake a very ineffective um, law enforcement reform, essentially ends up renaming institutions and increasingly militarizing law enforcement institutions. It goes back to the 80s, the Calderon years were uh, an up apex of that, but hardly a new trend. 
but then Calderon um, <coughs> charges on the horse into the war against the cartels, not realizing how long law enforcement reform will take, and starts um, um, falling into this very seductive pattern of high value targeting, my favorite uh, peeve and topic of conversation. But essentially there's this belief that if only you arrest the top campos, uh, crime will be there. Um, which is not how we do law enforcement in the US, and I'll be presumptuous and argue this is not how law enforcement is done in the UK either or Western Europe, where the focus is far more on the middle layer, essentially disabling the operative layer uh, of organized crime groups. Mexico is incapable of doing that partially because of corruption and strategic um, intelligence as well as tactical intelligence deficiencies, but also because there is this fear on the part of the US, if we give them intel, they cannot sit on it for months or weeks on, we cannot run um, network analysis and uh, interdiction operations the same way that we do it here, so there is a top campo, often very nasty, very brutish characters, they need to go get them. The response is a major fragmentation of these organized crime groups uh, with the rise of progressively younger and younger capos. So the old capos used to be in their 40s, 50s. They went through a degree of socialization into the criminal institutions and system as well as interactions with the state and corrupt law enforcement. Then the narco juniores would be in their 30s and these days many of the narco juniores are mid-20s. All they have experienced has been violence. They have very limited capacity to negotiate deals with other groups. And because the system is just so fluid as a result of the fragmentation and the continued high value targeting, that no one can essentially um, establish um, stable territories, very few groups. Um, Sinaloa has managed to do it again in, in Baja and in, um, in Ciudad Juarez, which I would argue is the major reasons why violence is down there. But in Michoacan, uh, where groups like the Zetas and the Templarios and La Familia Michoacana exist, there is this continuing leakage of suppression or elimination of certain leaders not only fragments the organizations and creates competition internally, but allows other groups to be attacking the territory. And it becomes a vicious um, cycle. So few of us have argued that Mexico really needs to change its pattern of targeting to move to far more sequential and selective targeting than this random high value targeting they have been engaged in. Uh, a colleague of mine, Mark Lyman, is not a colleague at Brookings, but uh, a professional excellent scholar, has argued that Mexico needs to focus on the most violent groups. Uh, but the Mexicans have essentially been doing that without much effect. So I have argued that uh, they need to start thinking about how certain interdiction operation will generate fragmentation and external internal competition. And that the focus needs to be on trying to suppress violence, hence being very selective in who is targeted at what point and how. It's a very controversial proposition and one that often gets the response, oh, but that means favoring certain groups. That's not my view. And in fact, uh, what I find very disturbing about the decreases in violence in Tijuana, in Baja more broadly, and uh, Ciudad Juarez, is that Sinaloa one, violence goes down, that's good. But now the state needs to come in and start addressing a scale of structural predispositions. Whereas the state in both cases essentially said, okay, done deal, violence down, we can move on. Tijuana check, the success story. And it's essentially narco peace which means that if the narco conditions change, the state will be equally vulnerable. Um, but so long answer to, um, essentially the criminal groups are under so much external internal competition and fluidity, they don't have the capacity to establish stable um, balances of power, stable territories, um, or even uh, sufficiently stable internal organization, and we keep compounding that by high value targeting. And uh, the Peña Nieta people have said, for us, suppressing violence is the most important priority. Very controversial statement, a lot of friction with the US. But nonetheless, what have they done? Got Z40. And it's falling back into the hugely seductive rule of, of high value targeting. On Upepe, look, uh, Upepe is a major um, uh, improvement on what the policies in the favelas used to look like. Uh, the theory is great. So you have these heavy forces coming in, supposedly sealing of the favela to uh, arrest uh, not just key leaders, but uh, 
also the other operatives of the gang, uh, establishing preponderance of military power, then uh, comes in the gentle, cuddly uh, community police uh, called UPP, and eventually uh, you will have um, socioeconomic goods coming in and improvements in the lives of the favelas under the Virada Social Program. Uh, in practice, implementation has been very, very uneven. Um, in many areas, the BOPE, the military forces, have not been transitioned to UPP, despite the fact they've been there for months, year almost. There is just not enough UPP, the generation is slow. In other cases, um, the UPP have worked quite well, uh, and they have been able to hold control even after um, uh, BOPE left. Uh, nonetheless, the Virada Social programs have been sporadic, have not come in. It's a long-term process, it's sort of trial and error. And yes, you have this very important phenomenon of essentially displacement of crime. So the uh, UPP effort has been concentrated uh, on the uh, uh, favelas that the Pope might visit, to be very you know, facetious about it, the central part of the favelas. And there's been a lot of relocation of crime to the southern portions of Rio particularly. I would not say this, is, this means that it's totally ineffective at all. In, in fact, I would posit that you need to start with the city center in the same way that Tijuana focused on city center. Um, nonetheless, it's not sufficient, and there needs to be a plan uh, to eventually expand <coughs> the, the ink spot, the, the security bubble, to greater and greater areas. And the state doesn't have the capacity, doesn't have the plan. And what's very interesting about the protest is how they will impact UPP. Because until the protest, there was an unprecedented willingness to allow for um, taxes uh, from middle class and upper class to go to these marginal areas that have been marginal for centuries. But now people are saying, why are we spending money on stadiums and the stadiums and the Olympics, but a big justification or big component of the narrative for the UPP. And so I'm just waiting when you will see, ah, we don't need to be spending money on UPP. It's extraordinarily expensive. You're talking about provision of public goods, socioeconomic um, services to these favelas. You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars for two decades. Who has patience for that? So I, 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 it's very interesting to watch whether the protests will essentially completely eviscerate the UPP or whether the UPP will survive uh, the protest. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh. Um, a difficult question, and, and indeed, you know, one of the reasons why these sort of broader efforts to rescue the slums or um, bring on the authority areas with uh, very um, limited state presence <coughs> or outright state neglect is precisely that it requires coordinations across a line of, uh, of institutions and agencies, but also vertically across a line of um, uh, a vertical line of different governing entities. Um, you know, let me try to mull this um, with respect to Indonesia, which um, has gone after 98 with uh, through massive devolution of power. From a very centralized, very powerful state, essentially anchored in the Suharto regime and, and the last phases, you now have um, a democratic system where many businessmen, come criminals or criminals come businessmen, dominate the parliament and are consistently elected, um, where law enforcement is very weak except in the counterterrorism sector, um, and where <coughs> rule of law or rule of this um, law <laughs> Uh, dominates the system. So there is no enforcement of anything. There's plenty of regulation and essentially no enforcement of anything. And this um, coincides with the big devolution of power to um, particular regions. So the, the, the degrees of 
they have provinces and they have these regencies on the provinces and even sort of city organization and village organization. <laughs> and each of the heads holds considerable degree of power and Jakarta is much less powerful than it has been ever. And this was done on the um, supposition that uh, this will then um, improve social conditions. This will really link up the people with the state in a way that was unprecedented. And that this will have a whole host of positive effects, such as greater absence of a far more acceptable state. I'm not sure that it's panned out, actually. Um, but it's a difficult proposition because you have, I would argue, augmentation of the uh, rule of this law, or uh, it's a different place. I, you have even greater intensification of essentially no enforcement of anything with a great deal of complicity and acceptance by local officials who set often very narrow, very short-term economic horizons. And so anything goes. And the meaningless what's legal and illegal becomes uh, essentially obliterated, where you know, much of the economy is about logging or it's about mining, resource extraction, and people issue licenses. But the, the, the licensing system so you pay a bribe, you get a license. What's the meaning of a license, essentially? What's legal, what's illegal, right? You have a paper, but you, you are not supposed to get the paper this way. And even if you then disobey the license and log elsewhere or mine elsewhere, no one enforces anything, it's OK. Um, so I don't think that it at all helped the rule of law. Did it uh, link the people up with the state? Um, somewhere, to some extent. Um, in other areas, people are quite willing to accept uh, degrees of antagonistic relationship with the state because they still believe that nonetheless the current environment, current economy allows them to more, man more money than they have previously. So there is a sort of degrees of complicitness and connivance uh, in a variety of these illicit rackets. And civil society has proven very weak in challenging the system and pushing the system toward greater rule of law. Um, you know, nonetheless, there is also at the same time an increasing movement against corruption, whether it's the Anti-Corruption Commission, um, or whether it's Jacobi, the kind of heroic, untested mayor of Jakarta, who seems to be running on the anti-politician, anti-corrupt man. But and I would argue the devolution made um, perhaps removed the alienation of people from the state, but intensified illegality and, and essentially obliterated meaning of illegality. And then you can look uh, at the complete opposite on the spectrum, and that's Russia, uh, with under Putin, extremely centralized state, and in my view, the most advanced mafia state ever. Law itself is the mechanism of expropriating public and private money. It's not aberration of law or going around law. Law itself is the mechanism how the state usurps money from anyone and takes it for its own purposes. Um, and so you have, you, know, an equal, you have a very centralized state, a very powerful state, the opposite of Indonesia, and really big distortion um, rule of law. So the bottom line is I'm not sure that devolution per se um, is a big determinant of how rule of law is enforced and how powerful uh, organized crime is or is not. And if you look at the FBS and organized crime groups, what is the difference between FBS, but organized crime groups challenge the FBS, the FBS is certainly not fully dominant either. Uh, which you know, goes back to a um, uh, real uh, difficult issue. I, I am writing a book on how best to regulate, manage a set of um, illegal economies. And I am increasingly of the persuasion that regulation is a very important aspect, whether something is legal or illegal and how it is regulated is very important. What, what, what are the rules and how they are enforced? But what matters equally is essentially the capacity and willingness of law enforcement to enforce anything. So you can have really well managed illegal economies and you can have really ba badly managed illegal economies. And you can have really well managed legal economies and really, really badly managed uh, legal ones, uh, really badly managed legal ones. And it's the, the institutional and cultural setting and the, the capacity and willingness of law enforcement to enforce whatever regulation is that it's as important as the actual design and regulation and the set of mechanisms you, you build into it. 
uh, which is then very hard social problem. How do you break out of situations where there is a lot of illegality? What needs to happen to end up in a happy state that we live in the US or, or here in Britain? Uh, okay, um, I, I'll take Charles Farr. Uh, we may have to take a, a group of questions. I'll, I'll take Charles Farr first and uh, then Ben Barry. Charles Farr, thank you. Um, so I'm interested in three big implications hmm. for work And we'll take uh, Ben's as well if you're okay to <coughs> group them. Ben Barry from ISS. I wonder if you could say something about um, all the Yugoslavia and the Balkans. Um, because it seems to me there's some quite interesting trends there. For example, my personal experience mm -hmm. was that the arms, the arms embargo that was imposed quite early in the war actually had the institutions of the armies and the state turned to organised crime. Mm -hmm. You both have been extraordinarily generous to suggest uh, there is a model. I would argue there is a set of propositions and uh, implications. Although in the book there is an actual model, but I have not talked about it in the talk about what the, what the model in the book is, what the framework in the book is. Um, so thank you. It was very kind of you. Um, in Western Europe, I actually think that uh, organized crime is managed rather well. That there is um, in Western Europe that you have achieved a lot of the goals, I argue, should be the goals of having good criminals. The criminality is uh, not very violent, um, whether it's uh, non-organized, disorganized homicides or organized homicides, they are very low. I mean, uh, a, a colleague was um, suggesting that, uh, oh my God, uh, murder rates in Ireland, I guess, has gone from two per 100,000 to 2.5 per 100,000. <laughs> I say, wow, you know, mm -hmm. only life was as difficult for other parts of the world. Um, yes, you know, there are big issues with, with, with ghettos and with, with marginalized segments of the population that are not well integrated into the state and society, and there would be areas where there can be mobilizations by militants and extremists as well as by organized crime groups, and these need to be managed and focused on, including via um, socioeconomic policies and via other integration mechanisms. Um, but I actually think that it's working rather well, that on a, on a host of, uh, on, on all three characteristics, this is what it should look like. And, you know, we, we have to be realistic that it, particularly with transactional crimes as opposed to predatory crimes, there is a limit to how much you can drive incidents down. And there is a big trade-off between incidents and side effects. Uh, and very low incidents can result in um, greater violence or other undesirable side effects. And it's often difficult for politicians or publics for that matter to accept that you are essentially balancing a set of risks and set of detriments. But preoccupation with, with going to zero, preoccupation with suppressing flows, Iber hours, <coughs> in my view is misguided, is about how you shape the criminal environment, uh, especially in transactional crimes, and how it interacts with um, societies. So, you know, I think that it's good. Uh, in, in Britain, and yes, you know, that there are situations where you will have merger between organized crime groups and, and particular militants that needs to be watched, those needs to be um, targeted. But at the end of the day, if the targeting is completely blanket, then not only is the real danger that you drive highly pernicious groups together in a way that you don't want to do, but also that um, 
you're essentially selecting, which law enforcement does almost all the time, the least competent criminals. So the least competent ones are the ones who are arrested first, mm -hmm. and you're progressively putting natural selection pressures to end up with more sophisticated, <laughs> more powerful mm -hmm. criminals. So that's one game you mm -hmm. can play, just blanket law enforcement, and you end up with worse criminals, mm -hmm. or you can play the game of this is the selectivity should be about those who are most tolerable to society, least violent, least capacity to corrupt, as distant from society as possible. Uh, on Yugoslavia, you know, thank God there are some places I don't know much about, so Yugoslavia is one of them. Uh, nonetheless, I uh, would posit that, yes, the phenomenon was very much uh, about um, the embargo uh, generating illicit economies that the state then was uniquely able to capture for the survival of the state. And that, that's important when we think about other places. I mean, there is often a supposition that the emergence of illicit economies or organized crime threatens the state. Well, sometimes it does. Sometimes it, in fact, enables the survival of the state. And you can have sort of a reverse phenomenon. So you look at West Africa. There is this sense, oh my god, cocaine is destroying West Africa. I would say no. The state in West Africa was always a mafia bazaar. The state always expropriated economies of any sort for a narrow patronage purpose of the clique that captured the state. And cocaine uh, today is just another economy that mafia state, mafia bazaar was able to uh, co-opt. But these uh, deeply pernicious dynamics between state and society are not about cocaine. They are about how state has been organized and how law enforcement is used as a uh, praetorian guard of the current politician de jure rather than anything that enforces uh, rule of law. Uh, so uh, you know, we have these deeper pre-existing patterns of social organizations that shape organized crime as much as organized crime shapes or, or eviscerates the state. But so in the case of Yugoslavia, yes, you have the state uniquely capable of uh, and interested in exploiting the illicit economy that the embargo set up for its survival. And yes, then you of course have this traumatic challenge of order and the phenomenon that the state is so withered that organized crime groups come to exist independently of the state and even challenge the state. Let's get into these extremely difficult social questions and conditions. Why is it that in Indonesia, you have a set of dramatic regime changes, fundamental shocks to the system, and yet at the end of them, including after democratization, state and politicians stay in control of organized crime groups. Whereas in other places, you go through these changes of collapses of regime, and you have completely different uh, balance of power or pre preponderance relations between the state and organized crime groups. And I wish I could tell you and the circumstances of Y and Z, it will pan out this way or this way, I, I can't. Um, uh, although, you know, it'd be wonderful if I could. Look, um, I think we've got uh, probably just about time for two more very brief questions. I'll take the lady in the penultimate row there who's been very patient and the gentleman at the end of the second row, and then I'm afraid I'm gonna have to close the bidding. And could you please be brief? I'm often accused of that. Yeah, well, maybe she's fair enough. But also, we understand that in the insurgency, you end up talking to the insurgents and they come to a compromise. Should we come to a compromise early with some of these criminal groups in order to facilitate some associational issues there mm -hmm. rather than combat them and then compromise them? Um, I, you know, the, the questions are interrelated. I would say it's not merely about socioeconomic policies. It's about extending public goods, a component of which is socioeconomic services. But the other component is providing more effective, 
and more available dispute resolution mechanisms, which can really be a very important wedge in separating <coughs> society from uh, states. Uh, well, um, where has it worked? Um, in, in some domains, some illicit economies in Thailand, um, I would argue very well, but you can even look at the formation and growth of the, um, of the US state in the 20s, 30s, and the radical changes both in um, law enforcement capacity uh, as well as in changes how population is more integrated uh, into the state. Um, I would not venture to go through British history, but I would expect that there might be instances where this would have been uh, manifested in, in uh, British history um, as well. Um, Italy, uh, there's many mechanisms to how the, the, the mafia is challenged. Lots of it is about law enforcement and, and courts, but lots of it is also about the change in institutions and, and, and economic policies, as well as public outreach and public policies uh, in Palermo, um, and pub creating public spaces, um, generating a sense that the state will act uh, in terms of public policy in a way that it has never acted. Now you can say that much of the Palermo success was more of a mirage of extending the public goods rather than actual extension of public goods, not, but nonetheless it worked in changing some of the alienation allegiance dynamics, even if you know, it was, I would argue Medellin, although you know, the Medellin miracle is over, it's more or less collapsed, but there was, there was a moment where um, it, it seemed to be working uh, uh, rather well. But I, you know, I, I am the first, to, I, and I think that the UPP theory is good. Mm. But the tricky thing is how do you implement it and how long you stick with it. And there is this very strong danger, which is a transition to your question, that the mo moment violence dips, the decision is, okay, it's good, it's over, let's move on, check, done. Um, I, I am actually not extremely fond of negotiating with criminals under any circumstances. Nonetheless, many people are looking at El Salvador and saying this is what should be emulated through uh, Central America. Um, non nonetheless, um, the, the important thing to me is not to stop at the moment where violence dips, not to conclude that the narco piece is the end state. I, I very much want to see that at the end of the day, the state becomes dominant. And yes, there is, a degree, there is a great deal of communication. There is a great deal of signaling. But the state needs to have the capacity to act against the groups if they violate the narco piece. Whereas what happens often with these negotiations with uh, the criminal groups is that all the power stays within the criminal group. Mm -hmm. And that if the criminal group, for whatever reasons or pressures, can no longer stick with the agreed deal, the state has very limited capacity to react. And that's a very bad situation. Nor do I believe that merely negotiating without changing the balances of power is sufficient. So if you look at Rio, uh, or Medellin for that matter, in both circumstances, there are several decades, or, or you know, 15 years, depending on the place, where the state negotiates access to the favelas, to the marginalized, the comunas, with uh, the criminals. And the negotiation is, we come in, we provide some socioeconomic goods uh, with your acceptance. We then get votes from you. And it just strengthens uh, the criminals. It, it doesn't help the state at all. It really changes the equation for the criminals. Uh, that's not the way to go about it. You know, whatever state presence, it needs to be about changing power and allegiance toward the state. Whereas these negotiated deals when criminals allowed the state to come in resulted in the, the public or the, the looking to the criminals as being the benevolent dominant entity. Okay, Wanda, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's always a great pleasure to listen to uh, a real expert, and uh, we've just done that. So thank you very much. Uh, it's thank been you. a great pleasure. I'm sure we could have carried on for at least the next couple of hours, but uh, unfortunately I do uh, have to bring this to the end. So could you please uh, join me in thanking Wanda for a very stimulating presentation. Thank you.